as a player, Zinedine Zidane won the Champions League only once in his career with Real Madrid in 2002. He did however have the chance to treble that tally as he reached back to back finals in the 90s with Juventus. His first bite of the apple was in 97 as the old lady faced Dortmund. That day there was one unlikely hero who kept Zizou quiet and prevented him from lifting European football's most coveted prize. Paul Lambert was born in Glasgow in 1969 and grew up in an old building not far from Parkhead. His harsh environment and his father both ingrained some enduring standards and attitudes within him. I was brought up in that environment that made me really humble. I've never been one for flashness. I took my trait of hard work from my dad being a grafter. He was a roof tiler. That's a proper job compared to football. The principle they instilled in me was never get beaten and if you do get beaten make sure you go down with a fight. That's my makeup. What is a bit flash is this amazing Zoman FC jersey. Three years ago, Zoman were in the third division in the Ivory Coast. Their rise has been meteoric and they now sit third in the top flight and are contenders for the League One trophy. Sangalo is the only site where you can support them and get their beautiful strips. Sangalo's mission is to showcase and support some of the most exciting and unique big football clubs on the planet and help them become a household name worldwide. Click the link in the description to get your hands on on some of the rarest football tops in the world and supports some massive but lesser publicised clubs. While he was still a child, the Lambert swapped Glasgow for Renfrewshire and moved to Linwood, a place Lambert loved and where he began and was taught some important lessons in his footballing education. We used to play street football, one street against another street. I was playing against guys easily four or five years older than myself, so I had to look after myself. I had one or two little skirmishes. He played for Linwood Rangers Boys Club before joining St Mirren in 1985 at the age of 16. It did not take long for the talented midfielder to break into the first team as he was a regular throughout the 86-87 season, making 36 appearances scoring two goals as the Buddies finished 7th in the Scottish Premier Division. St Mirren went on a fairy tale run in the Scottish Cup, beating Caledonian, Morton, Wraith Rovers and Hearts to set up a final clash with Dundee United. United were clear favourites, having finished 3rd in the league and made it to the finals of the UEFA Cup. The first first leg of which the Tangerines had lost 1-0 against Gothenburg in Sweden 10 days prior to the showpiece of the Scottish Cup at Hampden Park. Most were expecting the experienced Dundee United to dish out a bit of a scalping to St Mirren. This prediction may have been further validated when the team sheets were announced. The St Mirren lineup has no Tony Fitzpatrick. The captain, the club captain, has been left out. He's not playing in his usual midfield berth, and apparently there is no question of his fitness because he's been listed as substitute. He's on the bench with Ian Cameron. So that's a very interesting lineup with young Paul Lambert at 17 getting a place wearing the number 11 jersey. St Mirren's manager at the time, Alex. Smith has since explained his reasoning. He played as a regular in the team and when the cup final came we kept the semi-final team and Paul was in that. It was tough because Tony Fitzpatrick had missed the run up to the final but was fit for it. But we put Tony on the bench and played Paul, although he was only 17. We had absolutely no hesitation because of his ability and more importantly for a lad of that age, his temperament. United had perhaps also underestimated their opponents as St Mirren put the terrors under some serious pressure in the first half hour. Not at all overawed by the occasion, the fearless young Lambert was at the heart of it. Wandering around the park, he was hard for United to pick up and he showed a willingness to take shots despite a lack of execution. United then grew into the game which developed into something of a slog. Full of youthful energy, Lambert involved himself in the attack and found himself in the right place to bail his team out in defence. He was substituted for the man he had replaced in the starting lineup, Captain Tony Fitzpatrick, towards the end of the game. The match remained nil-nil and went to extra time. Where it suddenly burst into life. In a moment of real controversy, United had the ball in the back of the net, courtesy of Ian Ferguson, but it was immediately chalked off due to the presence of Kevin Gallagher on the goal line, who was offside and deemed to be interfering with play. Not long after that contentious call, Ian Ferguson scored again, but this time he was wearing a St Mirren jersey. Billy Abercrombie. Good bit of control from Hamilton, that's for Ferguson, he's away from Clark, a chance for St Mirren! There it is! Ian Ferguson!
Jason! There was nothing at all wrong with that goal, and it was the deciding moment as the Saints lifted the cup for the first time in 28 years and only the third time in their history. Quite rightly, Lambert wanted to give it loudly and celebrate his first success in football and a momentous day for the club with his teammates. The gaffer had other ideas and sent him up the road at 11 because he was too young for all that nonsense. That cup victory sent St Mirren on a European adventure in the Cup Winners Cup, but it was short lived, lasting only 4 matches as they were put out by Belgian outfit KB Michelin in the second round. Over the next 6 seasons, Paul Lambert established himself as a mainstay in the team, developed into a good all round midfielder and was capped 11 times for the Scotland under 21s. He would later praise his more experienced teammates at St Mirren. The amount of characters we had was amazing, and they looked after you. That could make you brilliant. Tony Fitzpatrick, Steve Clark, Frank McGarvey, Peter Weir. These weren't just brilliant players, they were experienced professionals as well, and they gave you such a good grounding. If you weren't right on it, they'd let you know. There was no molly coddling. They instilled great discipline, and that's something I took with me throughout my career. He did, however, not taste further success. Quite the opposite, actually, as in 1992, the Buddies were relegated into the first division. Lambert stayed one more season in Paisley, but had been unsettled for quite some time and was looking to move on. In September 1993, Motherwell came to his rescue and signed him up on a £500 a week deal, with £150,000 plus left back Jim Gardner going to St Mirren in return. The Motherwell team he was joining were coming off the back of a pretty dicey campaign. It had been one of the last years where two teams were relegated from the 12 team Scottish Premier Division. The Steel Men narrowly avoided that fate. With Paul Lambert installed in the Motherwell midfield, alongside the likes of Jamie Dolan, Billy Davis and Phil O'Donnell, Tommy McLean's men were the surprise package of the season. Playing the ball out from the back and passing it around marvellously, Motherwell emerged as surprise title challengers against Rangers, the dominant force in Scottish football at the time, who were chasing their sixth consecutive Premier Division crown. The head-to-head -head battles between the two ended all square, with Motherwell winning two and losing two of the four matches. Their 2-1 loss to the Jairs on the 4th of March was notable for a stonking Paul Lambert strike which opened the scoring. Fatigue ultimately did for the Steelmen's title bid as they lost their last three games of the season, finishing four places behind Champions Rangers in third. It had though been their finest Premier League season in over 20 years and saw them qualify for the UEFA Cup. They faced off against Borussia Dortmund in the first round, what would prove to be an important set of fixtures for Lambert's career. In the first leg in Germany, Paul impressed with his tireless running, clever movement and neat passing. He almost opened the scoring for the Steel Men in the first half, but was a whisker away from putting the finishing touches onto a move that he started. Minutes after this, a Motherwell threatened again, with Lambert once more instrumental, winning the ball high up the park. But goal machine Tommy Coyne was denied by Stefan Kloss in what was a bright first half for the Scottish underdogs, where they created numerous brilliant chances that they failed to finish. They were punished for their profligacy by Andreas Moller in the second half. This meant that the Well were tasked with overturning a 1-0 loss in Scotland. Despite fighting bravely, the quality of the Germans ultimately won through, scoring twice at Fir Park through Karl Heinz Riedel. In the lead, new manager Alex McLeish appeared to have one-upped his predecessor, guiding Motherwell to a second place finish in the 94-95 season. This is a bit deceptive however, as the league had been much, much less close and competitive that year. Rangers ran away with it, romping to a victory 15 points ahead of Motherwell. Lambert's third year at Fir Park was more or less normal service resumed, as they swapped the heavy heights of the top three for their usual place in the bottom half of the table, finishing the season in eight. He was coming to the end of his contract. Motherwell had rejected an improvement on his current £500 a week terms and he was dead set on leaving Scotland for pastures new. With the Bosman ruling having changed the game for players only one year previously, Paul decided he would try his luck. Lambert was put on to Dutch agent Ton van Dalen, who quickly sorted out trials at two clubs, but did not reveal which ones. Typically humble and modest about his abilities, Lambert assumed he would be off to Liechtenstein or Azerbaijan. As the new rules about end of contract departures were still fresh and misunderstood, so it seems was the etiquette of how you should leave your old club. As Lambert recalls, the Bosman ruling was new and I was free to leave, but Big Alec was expecting me to play in a friendly. He was going mad. I'd literally packed 
packed a bag and jumped on a plane to meet this guy I did not know. Upon linking up with Van Dalen, he learned the identities of the two clubs. The first was future Rangers manager Dick Advocat's PSV. Advocat was on the lookout for a nippy wide player, something Lambert had never been and would never be. One trial down and it was on to Germany and Borussia Dortmund, whose manager Ottmar Hitzfeld had been impressed with Lambert's performances against his team in the UEFA Cup and was keen to see more. Linking up with a team in Lübeck, a slightly daunted Lambert got a frosty reception. I got on the team bus and I must have sat on about 5 or 6 seats and every time a player would say, you can't sit there. It was Stefan Kloss who said, come and sit next to me. That was my seat on the bus from then on. He played 4 matches of a pre-season tournament, doing enough to win himself a contract, which was signed a couple of days before the new Bundesliga season was due to kick off. Upon doing so, he was told that he should expect to be well acquainted with the bench, as that's where he would be when new big money signing from Juventus and fellow midfielder Paolo Sousa was fit. After a whirlwind week, Lambert's Bundesliga debut against Leverkusen was a baptism of fire as the player he was meant to be marking scored twice. Despite bagging himself his first and only league goal for the club, they lost 4-2. Next game and the Scot was much improved, providing an assist in the 4-0 demolition of Dusseldorf. As Sousa struggled with injuries that whole season, Lambert was more or less a mainstay in the team, making 31 league appearances. Dortmund were unable to make it three league titles in a row though, as they failed to keep the pace with Bayern Munich and finished third. In Germany, Lambert was played in a more deep-lying defensive midfield role, giving protection to the back three, something he had rarely been asked to do in Scotland, but a job which he picked up quickly and soon became a master of. In his new role, Lambert helped the team to finish second in Group B of the Champions League. They were equal on points with Atletico Madrid, but had an inferior goal difference. The 2-1 loss to Atletico at home was the only defeat they tasted, as they looked an assured, organised and well-oiled outfit with plenty of bite and attack as well. After comfortably dispatching Auxerre in the quarters with a 4-1 aggregate scoreline, the schwartz gelben met the might and majesty of Manchester United in the semis. While most were expecting a United team with the likes of Roy Keane, David Beckham, Ryan Giggs and the mercurial Eric Cantona to make it to the final, Lambert remembers his team were full of confidence. We expected to beat them, that was the difference. I never felt any trepidation about facing Manchester United. We were Borussia Dortmund, a huge club with a fan base which was unrivaled at that time. To play Manchester United for us was no problem, we'll just go out and win, and that belief translated into a vintage Lambert performance. Calm and assured on the ball, he stuck to his role diligently, finding himself in the right place to make interceptions, as well as exhibiting tenacity, determination and tough tackling to win the ball back. His passing was simple and accurate, he almost never relinquished possession. One dodgy back pass aside, Dortmund dominated the game and were dangerous from the first whistle, creating numerous chances and pegging United back, limiting them to infrequent sights at goal. In the second half, on the counter, David Beckham had a great chance to open the scoring against the run of play, latching on to a lovely ball from Cantona, but his rather tame, yet goal-bound shot was diverted by Martin Cray. A few minutes later, and Dortmund's pressure and possession finally told, as the ball broke kindly for René Tretschok, who unleashed a left-footed shot which took a deflection off Pallister and flew past standing goalie Raymond van der Gau. It was a deserved lead, which Dortmund held on to, meaning they had something to protect on their visit to the Theatre of Dreams. We deserved to win the game in Dortmund, but the biggest thing for me after that game was a moment in the dressing room. The lads knew if we could score one goal at Old Trafford, it was going to be too difficult for United to beat us. We all had an unbelievable belief, said Lambert. And that's exactly what happened. After 7 minutes in Old Trafford, Moller completely wrong-footed the United defence to find Ricken, who took Schmeichel by surprise with a snapshot. Lambert and the lads then worked their socks off to keep Man United at bay in a fine defensive performance to record another clean sheet against the Red Devils and progress to the finals where they would face Juventus. Roy Keane, who saw something of himself in Lambert, would later praise the Scotsman's performances over those two legs in his autobiography. Before the final, Lambert was given instructions by the gaffer. In his video analysis of Juventus, Hitzfeld had identified a weakness in the old lady and told Paul, if you get a chance, look for the diagonal ball. They are not strong at the back post. The second task was simple only on paper. Follow Zidane. From the moment he had arrived at Dortmund, Lambert had been blown away by the ultra high standards of the club and copied and learned from his world class teammates who were uber focused and disciplined. He used every bit of that education on the park that famous evening in Munich. 
I applied all of my German discipline that night. A player like Zidane, he's most dangerous when you have the ball. He just drifts and waits. I had to try my best to drift with him, and Lambert was certainly busy as Juve started brightly in the opening exchanges. Zidane, of course, was trying to make things happen, but everywhere he turned, there was this tireless Scott, a free transfer and a virtual unknown just 12 months before that final, trailing him, suppressing him, frustrating him. With the shackling of Zidane successfully underway, Lambert got the chance to carry out his second instruction on the half hour mark. Following a corner, the ball made its way to him on the edge of the box. Sensing this was the right time, he floated a great first time cross towards the far post. Just as Hitzfeld predicted, it caused chaos, with Juve simply unable to deal with it. Karl-Heinz Riedel had all the time in the world to chase it down and blast it in to open the scoring. Five minutes later and they doubled their lead, with Riedel at it again, this time heading in an Andreas Moller corner. Lambert continued to stick to Zizou like glue, although repressing genius is not the easiest of tasks and the French maestro escaped his Scottish shadow to hit the post just before halftime. In the second half, substitute Alessandro Del Piero pulled one back for Juve, putting a fine finishing touch to a slick move. Five minutes after that, and Andai Schwartz Gelbin quashed any ideas of a Juventus comeback as Lars Ricken noticed Angelo Peruzzi off his line and lobbed him from some way out. The old lady looked shell-shocked, punch drunk and though they huffed and puffed, were unable to blow down the steel doors of the Dortmund defence. As the whistle blew to confirm Dortmund as 3-1 winners and champions of Europe, Paul Lambert became the first British player to win the trophy for the non-UK team. Although Karl-Heinz Riedel stole the headlines, it was the under-the-radar yet excellent man-of-the-match worthy contribution of Lambert, which had laid the foundations for Dortmund to claim their first European crown. As he lifted the trophy, the gravity of what he had achieved was not lost on him. It was surreal. When when I lifted the trophy, I just remember thinking how proud I felt coming from a small part of Glasgow where nobody gave me a chance. It really was a fairy tale to win it with a foreign team, without knowing the language or anybody and signing on a free transfer. Over the course of that season, the Dortmund fans had taken to the hard-working Lambert. What he did that night cemented his status as a club hero forever. Not surprisingly, there was some interest from Juventus in signing the Scot who had thwarted them. However, his son started to have some serious health problems and the family decided it best to move back home. Celtic were interested in Lambert. In November 1997, he moved to Parkhead for £2 million. He managed to play only 21 games in all competitions for Dortmund that season, taking his tally to 64 in total. His final game was against Parma in the Champions League, and the Black and Yellow Army gave him a brilliant and emotional send-off, underlining just how important a player he had become in little over a year. It was a season of huge significance for the club Lambert was joining. In 1997, Rangers Rangers had secured a record matching 9th successive Scottish Premier Division title. A 10th would set a new record. They simply had to be stopped. The manager charged with doing so was Dutchman Wim Janssen. Celtic were three points behind Rangers by the time Paul Lambert made his debut on the 8th of November, coming on as a substitute in a 1-0 loss to the Jars at Ibrox which saw them slip further still. He was again utilised off the bench against Dundee United in the Scottish Cup final as he won his first trophy with Celtic only three weeks after joining them. A turning point for Lambert and Celtic's whole season came in the New Year Old Firm game at Celtic Park. It was a must-win fixture. Craig Burley opened the scoring for the hoops in the second half before Lambert made sure of the three points with a screaming pile driver of a strike four minutes from time. After that, Celtic lost just one of the remaining 17 league matches, while Rangers lost four of theirs, meaning Celtic managed to stop the 10 by a slender margin of two points. This did not immediately kickstart a period of great success for Celtic. Wim Janssen left and was replaced by Dr. Josef Vengelos, who managed to finish second and trophyless six point behind Rangers. Paul Lambert's third season at Parkhead was a disastrous and depressing one, both personally and for the club. There was much optimism at what a pairing of John Barnes as manager and Kenny Dalglish as director of football would be able to achieve. The hope was short-lived, as questions were almost immediately being asked of Barnes and his formations and tactics. Celtic headed into the first Old Firm match of the season, having lost twice in the league and trailing an unbeaten Rangers by four points. With Celtic leading 2-1, a furious and frantic first half was just about over when Paul Lambert slid in late on George Alberts in the box. Not only was it a penalty, but as Alberts fell, his knee clattered Lambert in the face, breaking his cheekbone. Celtic would go on to lose the game 4-2, and Lambert 
Harris fell on the sidelines. Celtic season went down the tubes. John Barnes was sacked in February after a chastening cup loss to Inverness Cali Thistle. Rangers ended the season a whopping 21 points ahead of the Hoops, who had only the League Cup as scant consolation for a shocking campaign. Then, the right man arrived at Celtic Park at the right time. Martin O'Neill. We, we needed somebody like him. This club needed somebody like Martin O'Neill. And we needed that, that kick in the backside, I think. You probably sense it when you come through the doors and now the manager's installed a, an unbelievable an air of confidence, as you've said there. He, he makes you play better and uh, he, he makes you want to win. He's got an offer of a will to win and uh, it's really good into the players and hopefully if we can maintain that, you know, you never know. O'Neill swept the board in Scotland in his first season, bringing home a glorious domestic treble. Over the next four seasons, Lambert would win two more Scottish Premier Leagues and captain the team to the finals of the UEFA Cup in 2002, where they narrowly and heartbreakingly lost to Porto in extra time. I've gone into much more detail about those league titles and that cup run in my Bobo Baldi video. If you want to know more about it, you can watch that. Lambert was a vital cog in that successful Martin O'Neill machine. All his various different clubs and the influential players he had met had turned him into a complete midfielder. He could do everything and do it well. Although far from prolific, he popped up with the odd important goal every now and then. He was unflappable on the ball. He added bite and battle to the midfield. He was a tireless grafter and ultra consistent, giving his all every time. He was a true leader, an organiser and well liked and respected by everyone at the club. Lambert was also a great servant for the Scotland national team. He made his debut against Japan in 1995 when he was at Motherwell. It was whilst at Dortmund that he became a regular in the team. He started every match of Scotland's World Cup 98 campaign, their last appearance in the competition and one in which they failed to win a single game, losing to Brazil and Morocco and drawing with Norway. All in all, he won 40 caps for Scotland, with most of the later appearances being as captain. Paul Lambert was a world-class midfielder the exact type of player you would love to have in your team and the sort of character you need in the dressing room. He would do any job you asked of him, with maximum effort and efficiency, but minimum fuss. He was not one for bells and whistles, but fans of the teams he played for know just what a quality player he was.